Folks, before we start this episode, if you could do one thing, would you please hit that subscribe button? It really helps us out. We'll kick those tires and start that real fire. God, it's good to be camping in the bus again. We've missed you. And to welcome back reality, we have brought a very special guest, a Baroness of Broadway, a singer with a zinger, but also a ringer because she is taken, so don't get any ideas. I am pleased to welcome my dear friend and basically the voice of an angel to our little campfire. If you ever wanted to hear campfire songs on another dimension, this is your episode. So please put your virtual hands together for the one and only Laura Osnes. Wow, Ryan, that was the best introduction I think I've ever had in my whole life. Thank, Thank you. you. That did is, you just did you have that ready to go or no? Did that you was just off the off cuff for that? you. That was as a, I figured since Broadway, you have to as an actress and a singer, you have Improv. to roll with it, right? Improv. All right, let's get right into it. I have actually never interviewed a Broadway star, um, and I would love to hear what is an embarrassing moment or something, because I know every show is different in live. You must have a, a story or two. Yeah. Tell me a crazy mishap of either an audition or a night of performance. Sure. You know, I have, I've taken a lot of slips, trips, and falls, which is very embarrassing. I've been, like, elbowed in the face. Um, I lost my wig once during Greece, actually. That was probably the, like one of the most embarrassing. It was during a dance break and I did a dip and my wig fell off. And it was at the end when she's supposed to be like sexy Sandy, right? She comes out with the like big hair and the like black spandex. So what did Sandy look like? <laughs> uh, she looked like a probably alien because it's like a <laughs> wig cap with a microphone. Everybody on Broadway, you wear your microphone under your wig, actually. Wait, your microphone is... Really? Yes. Wait, so the rece the receiving end of the microphone the is... The whole box, of, like the microphone box and like the cord comes up and you wear your microphone here. Like the actual mic is here to pick up the sound. But the actual box is pinned to my head underneath my wig. So you kind of look like something out of the Matrix, right? There's just like wires coming That's out of your exactly head? That's exactly it. I'm an alien Matrix person. So I did the dip, my wig fell off, and it's lying on the ground like a dead dog. So what do you do? And my co-star, Max Crum, who played Danny, like got in front of me and like opened his jacket. And he was like, put it on, put it on. And I like swept the like dead dog off the floor and like put it back on my head just in time to like, we go together, like just in time. And it was really funny when we took our bow that night. He like put his hand over my head as we like bowed to make sure that. So it, it looks like he was blessing you. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs> well done, oh, for Sandy. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Have you ever? Uh, okay, that's awesome. Um, have you ever had any mishaps in a um, in an audition, or? Like, I've definitely had embarrassing auditions, but not like gigantic mishaps. I think the most. Uh, I don't know. I guess the most embarrassing one, where I just felt like an idiot, was like. I went in for a Broadway musical and I sang the song once and then they were like, okay, Laura, this time feel free to use the room. And I was like, what does that even mean? But okay, go big or go home, right? So I like crumpled up the paper. I was using the lyrics and I was like, okay, screw it. And I like threw the lyrics on the floor and I started crawling all over the walls on the floor like an idiot. Wait, actually crawling? Yeah. So you sort of, you channeled sort of the exorcist. <laughs> um, you were doing the Exorcist musical, right? <laughs> yeah, that's it. It was for Rock of Ages, and they I think they wanted a little, like, vampy something. And so I went for it, didn't get it. It's good. It so after good. you get up off the floor, were they like, thank you, Laura. Wrong choice. Just, we'll call you. <laughs> probably, probably, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. I was just, you know, I, you just have to be you in the room. I was like, I didn't choreograph a dance. Like, what am I going to do? They use the room. Okay, I'll go lean up against the wall and like give. I don't know. It was fine. Whatever. Now you, gosh, you've been in so many. You've you've done so much musical theater. Um, and we're gonna talk about your new album. You've been nominated for two Tony Awards. You've won a reality TV show, which is funny. The first time I met you, I remember posting. Um, that I had no idea I was in the presence of a of such a voice. And everyone's like, "Oh my gosh, I remember that show." So tell so us sweet. what is the lead up because would you would you say the you're the one that I want was sort of your breakout. For um, sure. Okay, so walk us through how you got to play the new Sandy. Yes. In uh, in the new Greece. Um, I was in Minnesota. I'm from Minnesota, and I was doing a production of Greece, playing Sandy at a dinner theater in Minneapolis at the time when I heard that NBC was hosting this TV reality show to cast Sandy and Greece on Broadway. And I decided to fly to LA and audition. I got permission from my director at the theater to like take a weekend off and fly to LA, and he was like, "You should go. You're gonna, you're gonna." get this you're gonna win this and I was like Th that's nuts like thank you but there was something in me honestly it was a total God thing like I felt God say go I just saw the word go 
And I was like, well, way too many things are going to have to go right for this to even be possible. And like, it was just like green light, green light, green light, like open door, open door, open door. And I felt so inadequate. I was like, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? And God was like, I'll give you the words to say. I'll, I'll make the path straight. And he did. And thank goodness, like I had the uh, whatever, that thing in my heart that was like, go do this because I ended up winning that competition. I can't imagine if I had let the fear... <laughs> prevent me from ever trying to go in the first place um and yeah moved we basically moved to LA to compete live on this TV reality show like American Idol we sang live on TV every week and America called and voted and, um, and it was just and it was to find the next Sandy so they would have you sing would they have you just sing Grease numbers or would they have you sing uh, all sorts of stuff we often did group numbers that were from Greece and like other musical theater shows and then every week we sang we pulled us they gave us songs out of an envelope that we sang we didn't ha have any like choice in the song some one and then every week had a theme so we had like 50s week we had um, Andrew Lloyd Webber week we had like a lot of them were pop songs um, or like some sort of genre. So they would just, I like, sang Fever. I they sang would just give you a songs. random song to sing? Yes. That sounds like an excellent idea. We should come back to that. Because um, I would love to test that on you. But okay. So you, you're you performing, and I imagine you make some great friends, right? I did. I, it was very a uh, unique um, experience because they wanted us to... We're on competition, right? We're all kind of competing for the same roles. It was to cast Sandy and Danny. So they had, for the live show, it was six boys and six girls. And they we all lived in a house together in Bel Air. And like, you know, towed it around the city in passenger vans and spent every waking hour together. This was right before social media. So uh, thank God social media was not a thing then because I think that would have added a whole other element to it. But, um, you know, we did get along surprisingly well considering the circumstance that we were. Now I feel like we were war buddies together because we went through this crazy reality TV show experience that not very many people really get to go through. Were there any Danny, Sandy? Like, I wonder, were they looking for chemistry between Danny and Sandy? Was there any like you know, behind the scenes romances between any of the Sandys and Dannys? Great question. Actually, not really. What? Which was really weird. Like, I'm surprised that didn't happen. I was engaged at the time, so I was already, okay. like, off the table, not looking. I think there were little crushes and flirtations for sure, but no, nothing ever that I know of came to fruition from um, all the Dannys and Sandys being paired together. But there was definitely, like there were chemistry tests like they they paired us up and we had to do duets and things like that oh that's awesome all right so the night you or the the, the day you won walk, walk us through that what happened so this is after like two and a half months of singing live on tv it's down to me and the very talented beautiful ashley spencer and again like i just had this piece I really did. In the midst of this very kind of competitive, crazy thing in my life, I knew that I was supposed to be there. And I kind of had this real, I kind of was the underdog. I was the last one saved. And I feel like uh, other people were front runners early on. And my performances every week, I was like, all I can do is be me. And I just have to trust that I'm enough and I'm, I'm here for a reason and I'm just going to give solid performances every week. And I feel like I had this kind of upward spiral where I proved myself every week as where other people kind of started at the top and then had to maintain that level of performance. Um, and so I, it was down to the final two and I was like, okay, I'm just, I like, <laughs> I, there was nothing, it, so much of it was out of my control and I just had to trust. But I did have a piece about it going into that final show in the midst of all the nerves and the craziness and um, ended up the, the host of the show like pulled the card out you know, and once the announcement happened he said looks like it's going to be a honeymoon in Hackensack. Part of my story was that I was engaged during the time so like I was the engaged one, um, you know, the contestant. And so he said that and I was like I think that's me. Like and he said, Laura Osnes, you're Sandy. And that was overwhelming. I mean, it was like my dream came true. I've wanted to be on Broadway since I was five years old. And uh, it was remarkable. Wow. So were you just, were you like numb? Like, did he say my name? Like, is this, did this, is this actually happening? Yeah. I mean, I, I like hugged Ashley and it was, I, it was mind blowing. Like, I just was like, whoa, like now what? Like, I can't believe this whole journey just, just became a reality. This dream I've had my entire life just became a reality. And then what happens? So what's the aftermath? So winning that competition, that launches you to sort of another level, right? So did they immediately do 
a Greece reprisal? Like how did that, how did your life as Sandy begin after that? Yeah, we flew, Max and I, Max won Danny, and we flew to LA literally the next day and did a press weekend, photo shoot and like several photo shoots and like several um, interviews. And then I went back to Minnesota and got married, <laughs> planned my wedding to be like right in the like, you know, month long kind of hiatus that we had before we had to move to New York and start rehearsals. And then um, we started rehearsal. The show finished in March, got married. This is all of 2007. The show finished in March, got married May of 2007, moved to New York June of 2007, started rehearsals in July, opened in August of Greece. So it was a life changing year. And how long did you do Greece for? I did Greece for one year. Wow. 12 months. Was that amazing? It really was. It was, again, dream come true. Um, it's the moment you wait for. And what was cool about it was the getting to do the reality TV show um, kind of b had a built in audience for the show. And like suddenly there were fans at the stage door who had watched us on TV and they were so invested because they called and voted for us. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So it was like this, my life, yeah, life definitely kind of changed overnight. Um, and I was so grateful I had my husband, like I just got married right before, so I didn't have to go alone. Like I felt like I had Nate with me to like help keep me grounded and weather that uh, really kind of big transition. That's amazing. So you did Grease and then uh, you started also doing, I mean, so you got to do a lot of stuff um, and then you were up for, um, like there were some musical reviews you were up for, right? Um, that you got to do. I concerts think, and things? Yeah, concerts. Yeah. I started doing, I started doing concerts like probably four years later. I was lucky enough to kind of jump to like two or, two or three other Broadway shows and being attached to out of town runs and readings of upcoming things. Um, and I started doing concerts actually when Bonnie and Clyde closed unexpectedly. Bro Bonnie and Clyde is my fourth Broadway show. And um, it only ran for two months. So it was not a very big critical success, but has since gone on to become a very, kind of a cult classic. Like the, the cast album has allowed the show to live on yeah. in ways that we never thought possible. Um, and I suddenly was available. I had, n I had nothing to do. I was expecting to do the show for a year and got an offer to do it like a cabaret show at the Cafe Carlisle, which is a very kind of renowned cabaret venue in New York at this fancy historic hotel. And I thought, who is gonna come like pay to come see me like sing and tell I don't I was like I don't have stories to tell and then I realized I do have stories to tell mm -hmm. and there's something cool about being in an intimate room with a human and seeing them be them instead of seeing them be a character That's but cool. that was a big learning curve I f now I forgot to I did want to ask did you when you were doing Greece did you get a chance to meet um, Olivia or John Travolta or yes. any uh, Greece stars yes Olivia Newton John was a guest judge one week so I did get to meet Olivia. I have a beautiful picture with her. She was so kind. She came to see the Broadway show as well. And I had her sign like my dressing room guest book. And she said, from one Sandy to another. Aww. And signed Olivia Newton-John. So I will always have that. John Travolta, I did not meet. He came to the show once I had left. Okay. Oh. Now, one thing I'd ask is, um, what do people probably not understand? You know, we see you perform. We don't sell the work that goes into it, but what is life like when you are a working Broadway actor, singer? Is that, um, is it basically, are your days just filled with rehearsals? Is it, con and are you in one place for a while while it, while it performs? And then um, do you typically, once it goes off Broadway, is it a new cast? Walk us through, I'm actually pretty ignorant of the sure. Broadway life. So how does it actually work? Um, I'll, I'll go through Greece as an example, because we were on that, uh, on that wave. So there's usually about five weeks of rehearsal in a studio or in a room, like 10 to six. So it's like a nine to five job, except okay. it's 10 to six because New York is the city that never sleeps. So we start a little later. Um, and I may, I may be not called all day, every day. There may be working on certain scenes or songs that I'm not in, um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's the day job. It's an actual job. But it's so fun because I'm like, this is my joy. This is what I used to do f for free. I'm now getting paid to do professionally for real. And what's cool about Broadway is that it's like everything's done at the top notch level. Like even in rehearsal, if you're eating a sandwich in the scene, like you get a sandwich and they build the sets and the scale. Like we had a wooden like grease lightning size car in the rehearsal room. Like that was, you know, a practice car. And I'm like, this is not community theater. Like, it's so cool. Um, and wigs that are custom made for you, shoes that are custom made for you, costumes that are custom made for you. Like that was, that I thought was really, really cool. Um, five weeks of rehearsal and then usually two weeks of tech rehearsal. So then you finally go into the theater. 
Um, and you add all the elements, lighting, sound, microphones, orchestra, costumes eventually. Um, and it's a long, grueling process, usually 12 hour days during tech or 10 hour days. Um, but that's when all the bonding happens and the show really starts to come to life. It's really, really exciting. And then you have a month of preview performances. So then audiences start to come at night while you're still rehearsing during the day and maybe implementing some changes into the show, like jokes that aren't working or um, timing that needs to be tightened or if it's a new musical, like still script changes or songs being cut or new things added. Grease wasn't that way. Grease is a revival and there's only so much you can do to change it. Um, but I was a part of original musicals that went through tons of changes during that preview process. Once you finally have an audience, you realize what's working and what's not. And then that's an exhausting time because you're performing every night and still rehearsing during the day. And then usually you record your cast album somewhere during that time. So you're like wearing thin right in time for wow. opening night <laughs> when all the critics come the week before opening. And then once opening happens, the show is frozen, they, they say. So no more changes. And now you just get to do the show eight shows a week. Understudies, if you understudy one of the leads in the show, they still have rehearsal twice a week they still rehearse. So understudies are always ready to go on. And how often does an understudy have to come on? Like how often does something come up where someone's not, or like your voice needs a rest or whatever? Yeah, You'd be surprised quite often, especially once a show is longer running, maybe at the beginning, uh, you know, maybe it'll be a month or two before an understudy goes on, but sometimes not. Sometimes an understudy goes on during previews when they've like hardly had rehearsal because we're all being kind of worn thin during that time. And understudies are heroes. I know so many people that have gone on with hardly any rehearsal and, you know, can still carry the show. And it can happen. Like what's the most, what's the like latest hour that you've <laughs> seen an understudy have to come on for like a big role? I've seen mid show. I had to call out once mid show in my whole career. There was one time I was sick, but I'm a workhorse and I was like, I can do it. I will charge on and I will show up. And I finished act one and my voice was like shot. And I had to learn that lesson the hard way. I was like, what am I doing? Why am I, why am I doing this to myself? It's because my work ethic is, too, sometimes too like hard for my own good. Um, and so I knew I couldn't, there was a song in act two that I was like, I know I can't sing it. This was for South Pacific. And my, I did, I had intermission. I, my understudy went on for me for the second act. Wow. So you work all that time as understudy and then you just, you know, you never, and you don't hope obviously, but like you, you know, but you get your chance, you know? For sure. And um, I, I'm trying to think, there's uh, during Greece, I never got sick my whole year in Greece. I never got sick enough to miss a show, wow. but I had to take a vacation every six months. You get a week of vacation. So um, it came to the point where I hadn't missed shows yet. And the stage manager was like, Laura, you have to take your <laughs> week of vacation. <laughs> and in Cinderella, I was actually the last person in the company to miss a show. I waited 10 months of my year long contract before I finally took a day. And I wasn't sick. Actually, I, uh, I was actually, I found myself starting to get kind of bitter towards people who were missing shows, which that's my mental state. You know what I mean? I was like, oh, their stomach hurts and they're calling out. And I was like, I am here every day and I'm carrying the show. And my co-star Santino pulled me aside and was like, Laura, you should take a day, like just for your sanity. The show will go on without you. And I think I had just wrapped my head around the fact that it, of course, like, of course it would. So I took a personal day and I went apple picking with some friends and the show went on without me. And it was a glorious thing for my sanity. Oh, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> and then I imagine you get tight with a cast, right? You become family. Oh, for sure. That's so, are you so close with members from like all past casts, like, you know, Greece and some, I, it's, I uh, will get into this, but it went through kind of a hard thing last summer. So I lost a lot of, of friends, but a show, your, your show really does become your family because most people, especially in New York are transplants. You know, they came from somewhere else to pursue a dream. And we don't get like holidays off. You know, you're working on Thanksgiving together. You're doing eight shows a week, no matter what. And you do a show for a year, you see each other through family deaths or family births, babies, people getting married, um, you know, hardships and highs and lows. You spend a lot of time with the people in your cast and they really do become like your second family and your, your theater or your dressing room is your second home. Hmm. Yes. Well, you did bring it up and I'd be remiss if I didn't, you know, ask you about it because obviously that's something that you went through and were aware of, but see how to couch this. So pandemic was, we'll say uniquely painful, um, for you. Is yeah. that a fair way to put it? Yeah. It's a great way to put uh, it. 
walk us through what happened because obviously there was some the press that there's some press that came out about you and uh, you were made even more well known. I mean, I, it's funny because like they say that wouldn't make you famous. You already well knew uh, America had said you're the one that we want. Right? <laughs> like uniquely difficult is hard. I think first of all the pandemic was very hard on the entertainment industry as a whole. Our, our business thrives off of large groups of people coming together, you know, in a small space and singing, you know what I mean? Which was like prohibited for so long. Um, so the entire industry basically shut down for like a year and a half. And um, at the time the vaccine had kind of just come out. Now this is summer of 2021 and things were starting to reopen a little bit. I actually filmed like a Hallmark movie summer of 2020. Like there were, you know, various parts of the industry that were figuring out ways to return. Um, but suddenly summer of 2021, there was like a tabloid article in the New York Post that came out about me that kind of turned the industry and its fan base against me. What initially happened was I had been hired to do a concert, a one night concert on Long Island as a favor for a friend. And, um, a month before the concert in August, the venue changed its policy to suddenly mandate the vaccine. And the director reached out to everybody privately. I, I said, I'm, you know, I'm not currently vaccinated. I guess I'll have to back out of this specific project. She understood mutual respect, you know, so much love. We went our separate ways and she understood. And then a week later, there was an article in the New York Post saying I was fired for refusing to get vaccinated. And there were things in the article that made it seem like I had lied about my status and was putting my coworkers in danger. And we hadn't even started rehearsals yet, like nothing had happened. And um, the article made it seem like I was unwilling to test and I had been testing regularly for other work during that time. The narrative is a little different today than it was back then regarding the pandemic. And it's interesting to see sort of the, the changes, obviously watching Tim Robbins uh, go on Twitter and talk about it. Yeah. I'm fe I feel like there's a pretty, you know, different as a different consensus now, it seems with what we know now. Uh, yeah, you know, has anyone reached out? Or has there been any reconciliation as far as folks going? Hey, I was uh, I'm sorry, you know, about what happened or anything? Um, n in small ways, which I acknowledge, and I'm grateful for. Um, but not like, to be honest, like not in, in impactful ways, mm. like it, it, this definitely put a wedge in uh, like, I would say a hundred percent of the relationships that I had in New York city because this view is just like, not accepted, not okay. Not, not tolerated. I'm more like live and let live. Like, awesome. If you want to get the vaccine, amazing. It was a choice for me at the time that, yeah, I just didn't, I didn't really feel like peace about and I value freedom and medically we didn't know, right. What exactly the long-term effects might be. Um, and I was, I was willing to give up a one night concert. You know what I mean? To, to wait a little longer. Um, but you also, I know another thing that was uh, not really mentioned that you were totally willing to be tested. I mean, it was like, sure. there was no, cause there are people out there who are like, this vaccine is bad. And, and that's a whole different group than, and I, something that I think happened during the pandemic that was interesting, right? Because, you know, the, the data seemed to be coming out and it was always, you know, there, we were always learning new information, but there was a significant group of pe uh, number of people that were um, like, Hey, I just don't know. Right. This is a this is a this is a whole everything about this is brand new to me from lockdowns to this new virus. I'm learning so much. And do you feel it's safe to say there just there wasn't a lot of empathy towards that position? I think that's exactly it, that there was one narrative that was allowed. And if you think uh, if you might think differently or if you even have a question, that's not OK. Yeah. And you are ostracized and. Uh, there were horrible threats, horrible, horrible messages I received. And I don't mean to say that like no one apologized. There has been some reconciliation with some friends and a few people who have tried to maintain um, a relationship, but it's always, to me, I have felt like the messages I received were like, love you, hope you're okay, don't agree with you. But like, if you need a doctor to talk to, like I know somebody, like everyone had to make the point to say they don't agree to still maintain their friendship because if you 
obviously you see what can happen if you take someone's side. You're like, how can I still be friends with you? So many people just had to disassociate with me because even association meant that they were affirming <laughs> my choice. Like it's, it's tricky. I think we've lost the art of just discussion and agreeing to disagree. That's, that just is not okay. Um, at least in New York and in the theater community specifically, it's yeah. one, one opinion is allowed. I think God has me on another path and I'm excited to figure out what that is. But um, there, yeah, there are still mandates and life has gone on for most people. And I don't think uh, the majority of people still realize that people who have made this decision still are not allowed to participate. You've been really open about your Christian faith. It is so tough to be a Christian uh, sometimes. And one of those aspects is, uh, is just, you know, Christ taught to not only forgive, but to actively pray for your enemies and the people who, and I don't like the word enemies, but the people, uh, people who, who may be you. just, yeah, inadvertently even per persecuting you. So, um, did you, did you do that at all? I'm, I'm curious. Is that something you had to do? Yes. Um, because I didn't know what else I could do. I knew I didn't have any control on changing people's minds or what people said, but it feels really good to hold on to bitterness. It's like you want people to know how painful the experience was, which is twisted in some sort of weird way. I think there were so many people that were like, oh, Laura will be fine. Or if anyone can handle something like this, it's her. And you're like, that's not fair. Like this really broke me and it feels good to like prove how hurt you are and hold on to that going like it's not just oh walk in the park to forgive somebody as a because I'm a Christian like it's you know it's my responsibility and it's going to be easy to forgive I actually started reading this amazing book by Lisa Turkhurst called forgiving what you can't forget and I haven't even finished it but the first like four chapters just had me bawling and you realize that it's actually you don't gain anything by holding on to unforgiveness even though it feels really good for a while <laughs> it actually prohibits healing and moving forward well what doesn't yeah, kill you great. makes you stronger i got my thick skin but i do still have a soft heart I've, I've, i cry a lot i mean that's the other hard part of christianity too right is like if it's true God says like, you know, the, the one, the one thing that will never like, f you know, it's like a, a man of many companions will come to ruin, but there is someone huh. who sticks closer than a brother. It's like, you know, everything that we put stock in could fade away and still go. And I, you know, I, you know, for what it's worth, I remember I was out in London a couple years ago visiting, um, a church. I just walked into a church. Um, and, uh, I had heard about, uh, so I, just, I just like to, when I'm in traveling, I like to explore, you know, random, random churches, beautiful ones. Right. And there's a sermon going on, et cetera. And then afterwards, um, I was just kind of hanging around and a man approached me and said, Hey, um, would you like some prayer? And I was like, I'm, I'll never turn down prayer because worst case you get something nice said about you, you know, sure. Uh, and best case, you know, maybe you levitate off the ground or some sort of, you know, lotto you numbers, never know. nothing like that's ever happened to me. Um, and, um, at the time I was going through nowhere near, obviously, what you're going through, but I had some own community, you know, there's always seasons of community mm -hmm. and you're always, always surprised, right. At how things go. And he, uh, and he goes, Hey man, I just, I feel like God, and he had a really beautiful British accent. So it sounded way cooler, Love but, it. uh, he's like, Ryan, I feel like the Lord is saying something very clear to me about your community. And I went, what? And he goes, I feel like the Lord is saying I guess he's Australian now too. He's like, who you start the journey with is not who you're going to finish the journey with. Huh. And remember, you have to be a good friend, but God picks and chooses people to help accomplish the purposes. So he is involved in curating your community. And he had no idea what was going on with me. Whoa. I mean, just at all. And I was, at the time I was you're just praying like, through some of that and I was just like, what? And he's like, and so it wasn't to, um, you know, absolve me of my responsibilities to be a good friend and work on myself. But also, uh, he's like, Hey, just by the way, like you are on a journey that is being cultivated. If you believe the Christian narrative, right? He's like, you're on a journey that's being sure. cultivated. And he knows the people that need to be placed alongside you to help accomplish that, which you have been prepared to do. So on that framework, I, if it is true, and that's why I, I'm, I'm always fond of saying I'm 90% cr uh, Christian, like could be, we could be living in an Elon Musk simulation, you know, good oh job on Twitter, good job on Twitter, we? by the way, wait, 
um, yeah, simulation, whatever's going on. But I was like, if that is true, then you just got uh, course corrected, which mm-hmm. is weird to think about it. And so who knows, that's right? Amazing. And that's now really you have a cool lot of cool story. friends. I mean, you met me after this. So, I mean, clearly the whole thing's worth it. I know. That's why I met you. And I was like, I know. And, and I was like, oh, you're like, I'm a singer. And I was like, I'm thinking, oh, like high school musical and stuff. That is not the case. Which, by the way, I do want to get into, um, you are a singer and you are still singing and this has not got you down and you have some new music that is out. So tell us, you have like many great artists taken pain and just terrible agony and (laughs) rebirthed it into art, right? Yes, thank you. Um, So I could no longer do what I felt I was put on the planet to do for the past 35 years. And... I didn't, I had to find some way to make art, be, still be creative, and also cope with my emotions during that time. And I had a friend that was kind of um, pushing me in a songwriting, planting seeds, I will say, toward us in a songwriting direction. And I always thought, that's not what I do. I'm not good at that. And I'm quite competitive. I only like to do things that I'm good at. And so doing new things is a challenge for me sometimes. Um, And I finally agreed to have one writing session. He paired me up with this awesome guy in LA named Aaron Kellum. Shout out to Aaron, he's amazing. With Endure Studios? Endure Studios. Love you, Jay. Yes, we love Jay as well, yes. Oh my gosh, the smallest world. You don't need to worry about anyone, by the way. If Jay is on your side, you know, the guys will take take anyone out. Um, So wrote a song with Aaron. I like sat down in a Zoom session for four hours and I had some ideas and I like shared my life story and we turned it into a song and I was like, oh, you walk away with a song going like, that just happened. We just made something out of an idea that I had. And um, st- I really kind of put my eggs in that songwriting basket for a year. And thinking, if nothing else, it's at least kind of healing. Or it's some way to express myself in this time where I feel like I'm, I'm being silenced in other areas. Um, And I just did it quietly, privately. You know what I mean? It's like no one's seeing these songs until finally a year later. um, I decided that I was like, I had five songs that I felt proud enough of and ready to share. And they were important to share. I felt like no one is telling this story. And I was finally ready emotionally to, to share them. And so we went to Florida and recorded these five tracks with an incredible producer named Jeremy Griffith. Um, and we just released an album a year to the date of me moving to Tennessee. And what's it called? It's called On the Other Side, which felt very appropriate because I feel like I'm with this music being released. There's an element of coming out the other side of the darkest valley that I had ever had to walk through. And these songs are finally my heart. I'm finally getting to share my heart and part of my story through this music. And it's been a really um, vulnerable, terrifying, <laughs> and yet rewarding um, journey. We'll put the notes in there and everyone can go download it, stream it, listen to it. It Thank sounds like friends. if people really want to know your journey, they can just stream and they can listen. And even more than this interview, it sounds like a little trip through that EP will uh, give people a sense of what you went through. <laughs> you mentioned uh, Nate Dog, your aesthetically appealing husband, who I've been told yes. is actually like, you know, almost as good looking as I am. Almost. Um, he's a great guy. Ryan. I love the guy. Uh, amazing photographer. Um, I love hearing this. Tell us the love story you. of how you two met because you can't make this up. Yeah, it's, it's a good one. So Nate and I met doing a musical in Minnesota together way back when. We understudied Aladdin and Jasmine in a musical of Aladdin. Granted, this is 16, 17 years ago in Minnesota. So I blew out, like this would never happen now. Um, but we, the leads collided one day and he chipped a tooth on her forehead and they had to stop the show and sent them to the hospital. There's blood everywhere. And Nate and I go on together and finish the show as Aladdin and Jasmine. We ride the magic carpet. Our first kiss is on stage. Rose petals falling. Everyone's singing a whole new world. And uh, <laughs> we started dating a couple days later. So what started and ended as a tragic carpet ride ended right. up being a very magic carpet ride. Wow. Have you been storing that one too, right? No, I want just, I want, I just had, I, I was like, but tragic carpet. Ride. I was like, that rhymes. So that's good. <laughs> On a um, tragic carpet ride. I know. So, wow. That's uh. so you met, uh, 
you met as an understudy. When, yeah. And see, we talk about understudies. It happens. You got never. You never won the magic carpet's just going to go the wrong way. It's true. And, uh, and those two. So you guys met, started dating. Um, did you? So for those uh, people in the audience, I was. I love asking this, right? Do you feel that you'll just know when it's the one, or are you more in the camp mm -hmm. of like you kind of like you pick? Because I imagine you had you know someone of your aesthetic appeal. I imagine had many suitors leading up to Nate before Nate was the chosen one. Um, so how did, was there something different? Like, how do you, did you know, like, this is the one <laughs> you cracked me up. This is so good. Um, I was not a date. I did not date around. Nate was my third boyfriend. Um, I had one high school boyfriend for six months and then another serious relationship that was over a year and a half. Um, and then I met Nate. So, so two understudies and then Nate. Right. That's right. Um, I, you know, there was such everybody else saw it before I did I will say about Nate I think I played a little hard to get I had just recently gone through my breakup with my second boyfriend so I wasn't really wanting to like jump into anything new however Nate and I did have like wonderful chemistry like we just gravitated towards each other we found ourselves always just wanting to like hang out or sit by each other or um and that just, it made it very easy. And he's such a gentleman. Like before we were dating, he just, he cared. I'm a, I'm maybe call me old fashioned, whatever it is. I'm, I like to be taken care of. And he would just open doors and like walk me to my car in downtown Minneapolis at night after shows and make sure I was like made it to where I was going safely, even just as a friend. And um, I found that very attractive. And I, yeah, everyone saw it before I did, and finally mm. it kind of seemed to become inevitable. Turns out he was my secret Santa for the show, too. It happened around the holiday season. And so as the final, like, gift for the secret Santa reveal, it was a date with him. So that was his sly way of did officially he asking you, me out. Was he? Did he say, look, Santa, <laughs> hey, you have never had a friend like me? <laughs> yes, he okay. did use that Just line. Just want to get one more Aladdin. We'll add more Just fun in there, in you know. There. Good, yeah. Uh, that's awesome. I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, try and trade in a little bit of your Broadway fame with some of your, that voice, you know. Um, would you be willing to, you know, let your vocal cords grace us with a little bit? Uh, sure. I didn't. I will admit, I didn't like uh, officially like warm up. So we'll see what comes out. But do you need to warm? What, what's actually a warm? How do you warm up? Let's see. Um, I like to. I like the me's. I like the hums. I like the sighs. Okay. Ah. Your awesome. turn. Like, ah. Nice. Ah. That's really complicated. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, ah. I can't <laughs> See, you have to be unabashed. You, no, no, um, no qualms here. That was good. <laughs> uh, let's see. Me, 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 me. Me, 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 me. Very good. See? That's nice. See, Ryan, you That's have a beautiful it. voice. You say me, 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 me. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see. Uh, can I just throw some songs at you? Just see how you do. Sure. Okay. I'm game. All right. All right. Uh, I'm embarrassed <laughs> to say this, but at one year, a couple years ago, my number one, I didn't plan this, but my number one streamed artist was Celine Dion. Uh, Love which was Celine. Not, yeah, so, uh, She's a goddess. Uh, my heart will go on. Oh, my gosh. Do you start every night in my dreams like do you start at the beginning or do you want like the you, this is your journey i want you to take me on that ship and i want to i want to fill the <laughs> i want to fill the iceberg okay, and i see. never want to let go jack yeah, yeah. <laughs> um okay um uh let's see i think you got to go for the money notes you got to go like you're here and there's nothing i fear and i know that my heart will my heart will go on and on. Whoa, okay, wow. All right, a, little bon a little bonus vibrato there. I was going to say, I don't have Celine's voice, so I can't quite sing it like her. That was still amazing. Um, we just belted I know out. you love Footloose, which is also one of my favorites, and there's a great song where someone is being taught how to dance. Uh, let's hear it for the boy. Oh, yeah, I love that song. Let's see. My baby, he don't talk sweet. He ain't got much to say. But he loves me, loves me, loves me. I know that he loves me anyway. That's amazing. Um, Mark, That's you got any song requests? She's ba it's basically open, open mic open now. Mic right? Open mic hour now. You want to throw out a song? If I knew the names of songs, I would call them out. But I mean, Aladdin, I can say, I, I 
Oh, a yes, whole new world. Yeah, whole it's a, it's do, a duet, Ryan. Yeah, do a whole, do a whole new world. Okay, let's see. Jasmine <clears throat> comes in in the middle. A whole new world, a dazzling place I never knew. But when I'm way up here, it's crystal clear that now I'm in a whole new world with you. I feel like we are in a whole new world in here. Wow. It's, there's stars, unbelievable sights. Indescribable feeling. Soaring, tumbling. Freewheeling. Through an endless. Diamond sky. Wow, that was awesome. We're basically on a magic carpet ride. It's not tragic, Ryan. That <laughs> it's magic. <laughs> I know. So that's actually how I remember. You were in the kitchen, and your husband, who's got a very nice voice, yes. um, he's like, "I can show you the world." Like very, like you're like, "Oh, very nice, right?" And then you come in with that whole new world, and I was like, "Oh my god!" Like, "Oh, what? What? You said you're a singer? Oh, Broadway singer? That's right. I missed that. You know." Thank you, friend. Um, all right. I'm gonna see any last one. Oh, one more, Celine. Could you do a little of the, uh, the prayer? Oh yeah, and I think you know the Italian. If I'm, I there's a there's a uh, the bridge is is Italian. Let's see, Sonia mon mondo senza più violenza. It's the harmony. Un mondo di giustizia di speranza. Il nulo di l'uomo no suoi cino. Simbolo di pace, di fraternito. And that, folks, is what we call a TikTok clip. Wow. <laughs> that was that was amazing. Oh, my gosh. Well, I will end with this. And you can just play along. But um, I can see what's happening. What? Our interview's almost through. Who? We've gone past our designated time limit, but I'm grateful to be here with you. Me too. Your story is inspiring. Your vocal cords are the best. But we've been talking for two hours and 17 minutes. It's time to get a rest. That's the best I can do. Wow! So, thank you. Can um, you feel... I, I can't go with you there. You uh, you are on an astral plane, and I'm down here. That's not true. Uh, well, folks, we have been camping with the one and only Laura Osnes for the Ultimate Campfire Songs Collection. Um, thank you for joining us, Laura, and thank you for sharing your story and trusting us to, to be here, and I do hope you'll come back and camp with us again. Ryan, thank you for having me. I'm such a fan of you and this podcast, and I had a really lovely time to get today. Thank you for creating the most serene cozy environment to get to um have this deep chat i really appreciate it thanks for joining us folks if you want to help us out and we're confident you do go ahead and hit that subscribe button here on our YouTube channel. And if you ever feel like just listening to these, you can check us out on all major podcast streaming platforms by just searching for I Went Camping With. And there, you should also subscribe. Thanks again, folks.